wanted to see the return of my salty unholes and so of course mama found a way to provide. Don't say I never did anything for you little darlings. Welcome back to another video. As the title do suggest, this is a video in which I will be getting rid of a lot of books. Well actually that's kind of a lie. I already have got rid of a lot of books. In one of my wrap up videos for 2023, I think maybe my stats video, I told you guys that one of the reasons why you hadn't been seeing any salty unhauls from me for the last sort of six months or so was because I realised that the way in which I was doing them was actually affecting my mental health. Essentially what I would do is every time I decided that a book was leaving my shelves, be that because I'd gone through and done a really really thorough cull, or be that because I tried it and decided it wasn't for me, or because I tried it and wanted to set it on fire, what I would do with those books afterwards is I would gather them here right here next to my desk where over the weeks between salty unhaul videos they would just pile up and pile up and pile up and so every time I came into this room I would look at them and I would be like that is not tidy this room is never tidy no matter what I do with it I cannot make this room tidy and so once my brain went oh it's the stacks of haul books and unhaul books that are causing the issue I started just getting them out of my house as quickly as possible which meant that I wasn't keeping a list in any way to tell you guys about them which is a problem because I am a deep believer in the duality of loving hauls and unhauls. While I absolutely adore watching my favourite people enjoy their favourite thing which is finding the next new shiny book that might be their favourite book, I also want to see my favourite people getting rid of their books. I want to see them cleansing their space and also their brain boxes and telling us why books just don't work for them. But you guys, because you're absolutely lovely human bloobs, told me that much like all of my other content, you don't really care if I actually have the book here to, you know, physically throw across the room, although you will miss the book tossing portion of the content, but that you would be just as happy with me sitting here and listing off a bunch of things that I hated. And so that's what we're gonna do. In this video, I'm gonna tell you about 50 plus books that have left my house between now and I would say November time. And I have handily broken these books down into categories for you. Just going in alphabetical order, the categories will be bored, hated, loathed entirely. Not gonna read it. Other, I will explain, problematic as fuck and just straight out weird. Which let's be honest I relate to because I am also just straight out weird. So without further ado let us race to the first category. And just for the sake of continuing in alphabetical order let's go with the first category Bored! Every single one of the books on this list were books that I tried and they made me You know your girl has serious issues with insomnia, right? I could literally have just started reading any of the books from this list and it would have solved it instantly. And the first book up on this list is kind of a controversial one. It's one that I'm sure a lot of you are going to be like, yes, but we thought that would be right up our alley. And so did she. How have we ended up here? And that book is Tomorrow and Tomorrow and Tomorrow by Gabrielle Zevin, which I really wanted to like. I mean, let's be honest, there's not a single book on this list that I picked up and brought into my house because I didn't think that I was going to like it. When you buy a new book, there's like the, oh, this sounds good, I hope that I'll like it. Or there's like, oh, that sounds right up my alley, that has ticked so many boxes, I better like this. And in my case, that means let me put it on a shelf and I will read it in about four years time. And then I will kick myself for not having read it sooner. Ah, rainy day books forever my nemesis. Tomorrow and Tomorrow and Tomorrow was very, very much the latter category of new buy. Okay. Sure. Are you okay? Look at that. Okay. 
Okay, well, while he crunches on in the background, where were we? Oh yes, Tomorrow Times 3 was very much in the latter category. I genuinely thought that I was going to fall in love with this. But unfortunately, you guys, I was so bored. As a kid who grew up in the 90s, this should have been right up my alley. Like, the amount of video gaming content in here should have been something that I adored. But instead, I just found myself flipping the pages going like, when will this end? And maybe that was the fundamental issue in here. Maybe this book just wasn't for me. Maybe if you are a gamer nerd or a programmer nerd, or maybe if you just have a higher tolerance for sitting through explanations of how things that you're never going to interact with in any way work, then this one would work better for you, but it certainly did not work for me. And on top of that, on top of that, there are several sentences in this book which give me the large ick. Like, I don't know very much about Gabrielle Zevin as an author. I don't know what their views are about anything. But <laughs> there were several sentences in here where I was just like, made me uncomfortable enough that I was unwilling to push through the boredom. So I binned this and then pretty much the minute that I binned this a bunch of people linked me to articles which have like varying degrees of information about some intellectual property stuff that went on with this book wherein there was a female board game designer whose ideas were not credited even though they were clearly used in this book. And so I'm kind of glad that I ended up being bored and icked out by this book before I found out all of this stuff and not after. And while this has been quite a long explanation for why I got rid of Tomorrow Times 3, trust me that I have less to say about several of the other books on this list. The next book up on this list is The Witches at the End of the World by Chelsea Iverson, which is a book that my lovely mother brought home from holiday for me. She went halfway around the world and the first thing that she did was find crystals and bookshops to bring me gifts, which is very sweet. And I don't know about you guys, but my mother has a very strange propensity for wanting to find me books that I have never heard of before. And I get it, it's nice to just gift people surprise things as opposed to just picking things off a wish list. But at least a wish list guarantees you that the person does not have it and does not hate it. And also that the person would be interested in it in the first place, which is actually really the issue with this book. This one read like it was trying to be a darker and edgier version of The Bear and the Nightingale, which is unfortunate because I have already read The Bear and the Nightingale and I really liked it. The prose in it is just fine. There were a couple of lines where I was like that's pretty but really you guys know that I'm never gonna fully invest in a book that I'm like mm, yeah that was just pretty prose. <laughs> and so despite the fact that this one came all the way around the world to enter my house it has nevertheless left my house. Next up is Among Thieves by MJ Kuhn which is a fantasy. I don't know whether it's a standalone or it's the start of a series and it's funny because when I bought this book I bought it completely blind. I knew absolutely nothing about it. When I sold this book the place that I sold it for had added the tagline to the ISBN TikTok made me do it and I was like oh I see. It was written as if it was written to be optioned for TV. Like the descriptions weren't there to elicit emotions, the descriptions were there to provide a cinematic visage that hopefully some nice producer or director might spot one day and go ah! And incidentally this was one that lovely spouse Harry had also picked up because he frequently browses my shelves and is like is that any good? Is that any good? What's this one about? And he really liked the sound of it and picked it up and was also like meh. So that's a double thumbs down from this household. <laughs> Next up we have one that I'm really sad about. This is Dirt Town by Hayley Scrivener. This is a thriller that is set in Australia and it was boring. It was dry but not like the dry. <laughs> it was a really bad pun but it still kind of worked. And I think that's one of the issues is that Dirt Town was sold to me very much as like the next Jane Harper. It's Australian fiction. You love Australian fiction. It's set in a little like backwater town in Australia. Everything feels very droughty. And then it wasn't anything like the dry and it wasn't as compelling and the characters were just bleak. This is another one of those thrillers that fall into the category of thrillers, crime, mysteries and horror, all of which just have really, really depressing characters and depressing settings from the outset. And there's no peaks and troughs, there's no moments of joy, there's no moments where people are just like happy and living their lives. 
everything is sad and depressing from the minute that you go in. It's just so unrealistic and I just don't jive with it anymore. Next up I have got Days at the Morisaki Bookshop by Satoki Yagasawa. This one is a very very short like novella length translated Japanese literary fiction and those are always hit or miss for me either I am fully the entire time invested loving the atmosphere or I'm not and it's just like I don't care. And that unfortunately is the fate of this book although weirdly when I was reading it with my Patreon book club at the end of last year I was actually like kind of charmed in the moment about it. I was quite excited when I was reading it but the second that I put it down I was just like oh that was a thing that I read and so that one is gone. The same goes for the Mad Women's Ball by Victoria Mass. I have had this on my shelf for years. I picked it up like three times desperately desperately trying to get through this and I was just bored like genuinely so bored that I wasn't taking in any of the words and I had like read three pages and I had, would have to go back to the start and then try and read again and it just wasn't happening. Next up I am actually really sad about this one. There's not tons on this list that I'm gutted about but this definitely is one of them. This is The Darkness Before Them by Matthew Ward and it's the start of a new fantasy trilogy I think. It started out so well. It started out so good. We had two very different female characters who were thieves. There was sapphic joy from the very first page. The world was set up in an interesting way. The magic was presented to you in an interesting way but I hit somewhere around page 100 and I was just like this isn't going anywhere is it? Like you don't actually intend to do anything with these characters do you? Don't get me wrong the plot was plotting but the emotions were not emotioning. I just didn't believe anything that these characters were doing. Beyond the first setup pages and again the first pages of a book are the most edited pages of a book so they're the pages that are seen by the most amount of people in order to make sure that when readers pick it up they're hooked. And the emotions and the way that the characters interacted with each other in the first sort of 50 pages of this book just really didn't jive with the next 50 pages. I'm so sad, I'm so sad because I was so sure that I was going to love this one based on the magic system but hey ho you can't win them all. Next up there is Ginger and Me by Alyssa Sove. This one is marketed in a weird way. It feels more literary fiction mystery than it does thriller but it is very much in the thriller section and on the thriller tables because there's an unreliable narrator in it. I picked this one up fundamentally because it is a debut Scottish author and it is set in Scotland and a few of the places that I recognise really really well from my childhood but it completely failed to grab me. The main character in this one is an extremely unreliable narrator and it's made very clear to you from the first page but it's not done in a clever enough way that it made me go, oh, I'm being lied to. Why am I being lied to? Instead, I just kind of sat there going, okay. And from the very first page, I can tell that you're very heavy handedly trying to hint to me that this thing that you're being accused of was not a thing that you think you did but you did actually do. It's just that there's extenuating circumstances and I really just didn't care enough to get to the extenuating circumstances. Then we have Excavations by Kate Myers. This one was sent to me from the publisher and I was giddy when I read the synopsis. It's about a group of women who only come together for digs like once a year. They don't particularly like each other but then when they make a huge discovery on the dig that they're on and the man that's running it wants to cover it up they're like eh, uh uh no and they have to work together but actually in point of fact this was not about the dig it wasn't about the mystery it really wasn't about even the feminism of being like you can't hide this thing just because it doesn't jive with your very male gaze way of seeing excavations and digs into Greek culture. It was instead a very sort of surfacey contemporary book which felt kind of like the archaeology version of Sex and the City and again don't get it twisted the early days of Sex and the City were good times but like these girls just did not like each other and I found it very very difficult to believe that they were working together for any particular purpose and then the rest of it was just trying too hard. Oh speaking of mess marketing the next one that I have got is She Who Became the Sun by Shelley Parker Chan. There are a couple of big fantasy messes on this list and the reason this one is here is fundamentally because this was a historical fiction novel that got a little bit of magic put into it and then it got chucked into the fantasy section and it was one of those ones where it was like I see the plot I just don't really care about the plot and I don't think you care about the plot either I think you 
care about giving a history of this region at this time, which is totally banging, go write that book. But the magic is misplaced, and when I say magic, I mean magic, it's very, very thinly veiled magic. So yeah, again, vastly not my jam. Another one that I'm really, really sad about is Certain Dark Things by Silvia Morena Garcia, and very much like we say with Terry Pratchett in the Discworld, like this is Terry Pratchett does rock music, this is Terry Pratchett does the birth of the post office, this is whatever. This one is Silvia Morena Garcia does vampires, and the vampires very interesting. The vampires are very cool. The concepts for the different kinds of vampires generally kind of like box breaking, very like unique. The setting on the other hand, cyber steampunk. Could not have cared less if it had literally pushed itself in my eyeballs and became part of my being. I don't care about tattoos that move, I don't care how many neon colours are in your signs or how much plastic you're wearing on your body as fashion. I don't care about like the nanotechnology that you're putting in your body, it's just not my setting. I don't like traditional steampunk, like mechanical steampunk in a fantasy setting and I don't like this kind of steampunk either. So this one left my house and it actually started the breakup of my Silvia Marina Garcia collection and I have since also got rid of this one, the name of which I can never remember, but which I painstakingly, painstakingly tracked down a pristine hardback off which has now like been sold so that's good I've scraped back a little bit of my spending money on one of my favourite authors cash and also the beautiful uh this one which again was very historical fictiony and again was one that I was just like snooze. All right next up is a category that I know that you guys are going to absolutely adore and that category is entitled I hated it. There are a lot of books on this list that vary all the way from books that I finished and was like why at the end of to books that I DNF'd in the first five pages or so. The first book on this list is The City We Became by N.K. Jemisin. This is 100% my very last try with N.K. Jemisin. I love for you if M.K. Jemisin's prose works. I love for you if her weird sentence structure works. I love for you if her really standoffish hold you at arm's length characters work, but they do not work for me. This is the third N.K. Jemisin that I have tried, all in completely different series, and every single one of them has been a massive flop. I hated the start of this book, not just didn't like it, not just was bored by it, I actually hated it. And once again, it should not take a book to like page 100 before the concept that you are sold in the synopsis actually kicks in. I was so angry reading this book and so many people love it, like so many of you all just absolutely jive with anything that M.K. Jemisin does and I'm sorry, it's just, I, I wish it was me, it's just not me. And I'm going to stop wasting my cash, my space on my bookshelves and my eyeball time. Next up is Witch Bottle by Tom Fletcher. This is one of the backlist horror titles that my patrons picked for me for my January TBR and lots of you guys, like lots of you guys were like, I can't wait to see what you think of that because it's weird and it's not exactly what it says it's going to do. And actually that was fine, the fact that it wasn't exactly what it said it was going to do in the synopsis and this one wasn't the issue. The issue was that I just didn't care. I didn't care about any of the characters and I also didn't believe what was going on. I couldn't believe that this whole community were just like, oh yeah, witch bottles, huh, that's weird. Also there's a giant in this story and I'm like, I don't know quite how we got here from like depressed milkman who uses a witch's services to try and make his life better, but here we have found ourselves and I would like to leave. Next up we have Monsters, A Fan's Dilemma by Claire Dederer, which was not a dilemma for me, this was a really really easy please get the hell out of my house. If you have not watched my tops and bottoms for January then you are in for a absolute treat because I spent a lot of time talking about this book here and what is wrong with it. But it's interesting because since this book has come out and I've had conversations with a few people who have read it, a few people who have also tried it and disliked it. The overwhelming thing that I've heard about this is people being like, this book is actually a little bit dangerous because she presents an opinion about this subject like it's fresh information and she presents it in a way that it should appeal to people who don't regularly read non-fiction and so maybe don't really have a basis in kind of critical thinking about some of these subjects and so are kind of like duped into this point of view of it's totally fine for artists to be problematic and for you to continue enjoying consuming and promoting their art. I do it and nothing bad's ever happened to me and I could not agree with that 
more. So yeah, instead of just unhauling this book, I wish I could have lit it on fire and like pushed it out into the middle of a loch. Next up is Shanghai Immortal by A.Y. Chow. I have very little to say about this book except that I read the first 20 pages of it and went, <laughs> this is not for me. And you know what? Apart from anything else, unhauling over the last few years has taught me that it is actually just totally fine for books to just not be for you. Next I have two horror books. I have 12 Nights at Rotter House and The House of a uh, hundred thousand something this book now I think the reason that I discovered that these two have such low such terrible ratings such bad reviews from people that I really really trust was when I was putting together my poll week for my patrons so they could pick my January TBR and since I have done my research and I've just decided I'm not even going to try these two they've been sitting on my shelves for at least two years by this point I clearly am not that motivated to pick them up anyway so why keep them there now that I know that people who have very similar horror views to me don't like them. Oh, uh, next up is Notepahit Gloss. I'm so sad about this. I DNF'd both of the books for my January Patreon. We had The Historian, which is also gone by the way, and then Notepahit Gloss. And oh. Notepahit Gloss was also a TBR veteran. It had sat on my shelves for like such a long time, but in the first five pages, I discovered that there were vivid, vivid descriptions of piles and piles of corpses, what they smelt, what they looked like. And while that is not actually normally a reason that I would nope my way out of a book, like I have read similar things in the past that have been extremely dark and I've been fine with it, this one then mentioned a pandemic and I was like, nah, -uh, absolutely not. I am out. I do not want that even in my sci-fi fiction. So that one is gone, which is very sad because there may very well have been queer found family later on in the book which we know that I love but I wasn't pushing myself through to find it. Next is a bunch of books that I can run through very very quickly with very little commentary on them. We have Twisted Love by Anna Huang. This one was aggressively not for me. So much so that in the first 20 pages or so I was like what is happening here? Why are these people talking to each other like this? Why does she not know that her nipples are hard and you can see through her top when she got soaked to the literal skin. How could she have been so distracted by his hands that she didn't notice that? And then I just worked out that once again, this book, not for me, not written for me, not the kind of romance girly that was ever gonna enjoy this. It's not actually the book, it's just me. So that one left. Then we have the category problematic as fuck. The first is Erotic Vagrancy by Roger Lewis. I genuinely think that monsters and erotic vagrancy are the books that I have roasted the hardest on my channel in the entire time that I have had it. This was such a bad book. It was so problematic. The author very openly has written articles on how they essentially hate women and lesbians. They called Welsh a strange monkey language and it was so bad. The controversy over some of these things were so bad that one of their publishers actually pulled a whole book deal and was like, boy, bye. And obviously I wouldn't have picked this book up had I known any of these things, but the way that Elizabeth Taylor is treated in this book and this is not coming from like a massive Elizabeth Taylor fan who's out here to protect her honour but the lack of nuance in the way that he treats her the way that he calls her essentially a malingerer for all of the horrible chronic conditions that she suffered from in her life the way that he essentially blames all of the problems in her life on her and not on Hollywood manipulation, the industry, other men in her life, societal expectations, and yet he treats Richard Burton with this kind of like irreverence that's like, I want to either do you or be you. I was just like, no, no, Nami, I am out. Ordinary Monsters by J.M. Miro, which ended up on my worst books of 2024 list. If you want more detail about that, I went into quite a lot of it in that video. But thankfully, now that it's gone, I can stop having the internal debate about whether it's J.M. Miro or M.L. Rio whenever I am reading out the title of this book. I have some questions for you by Rebecca Mackay, a book which on the surface should absolutely have worked for me. It was about somebody going back to their school and teaching a class about podcasts and media to a group of kids who wanted to solve cold cases when in fact a like, person from their dorm had been murdered when they were there at that school and then they end up trying to solve that. Should definitely have worked for me. The actual plot of it, kinda cool, not gonna lie. Even the dogs don't like it. However, also the book that had a whole ass actually intelligent adult woman ask her best friend's wife if the reason that she got breast cancer in one part of her 
breast was because a guy had touched her in a sexually abusive way in college and that touch had festered over all of those years and was finally coming back to roost. I'm not joking. There was also some really aggressively horrible stuff in here about the Me Too movement because the main character's ex-husband is accused of sexually assaulting and mistreating his black young assistant many many years ago and she's now come out and told people about it and the main character like doubles down again and again and again about how he couldn't possibly have done that even though he wasn't that great of a guy if you divorced him my friend. Such a dumpster fire. Next up a very small category is not gonna read it. You guys know that I've done a lot of work work on myself over the last two years about looking at my book buying habits and thinking why am I buying these books and then why am I keeping them? Like why are they on my shelves if I don't want to read them? And a lot of the books on this list are books that I bought fundamentally for the wrong reasons because there was a lot of hype around them. The people that I really love were loving it and even though I knew that the book probably wasn't going to be for me I wanted to feel that joy with them or because I was hyper fixated on a particular genre or a particular kind of trope and I decided I wanted more of that thing even though I knew that at some point the hyper fixation was going to run out and I was going to move on to something else. Some genres and things that I love are going to stay around perpetually forever. There are other niche types of subgenres that have kind of just like insisted crept their way into my library which need to not be there anymore. One of those was definitely popular sci-fi. At one point I definitely was like oh what are all of the books in the last 10 years that people have really loved in the sci-fi genre? Let me collect and read those. Knowing that really sci-fi for me is kind of more like a hit and miss. So there's Embers of War which I really love the synopsis of but it's about a sentient ship and a war and I'm not gonna read it. Sleeping Giants by Sylvia Novell which even now I'm not entirely sure I have the synopsis of right. I think it is about pieces of like large giants which have been excavated by archaeologists in our world which have come from another world. That's literally all I know about it and it's all I've ever known about it and I just don't know why I bought it. And then Ancillary Justice by Anne Leckie which was never, never a book that I was going to read. It was never a book that I was going to enjoy and yet for some reason I have bought it twice in my life and both times I've unhauled it. So uh, here we go. This is the second time and it will be the last time you heard it here first. In the tiny other category we essentially have Ava Reed. So I read The Wolf and the Woodsman by Ava Reed, and I genuinely quite enjoyed it and I kept it on my shelves because I was like yeah it was a fun reading experience but realistically it was like a 3.5 star book and I don't need to keep 3.5 star books on my shelf but when I read A Study in Drowning it just it was so bad guys it was so incredibly bad that I kind of looked at it and then I looked at Juniper and Thorn which was also on my shelves which I also hadn't read and I was like do you know what I'm good I don't need that in my life and so I unhauled all of Ava Reed's books and I don't feel bad about it. Again some authors just aren't for you and that's fine. Then there is On the Nature of Magic by Marion Womack another book that suffers from not indicating anywhere on the book that it is the second in a series. The synopsis does not lead you to believe that it is. The inside cover of the book doesn't have like also in this series or first in a series or anything like that. There's no numbers on the spine. I should not have to. I should not have to stand in a bookshop and literally look on Storygraph or Goodreads for every single book that I want to pick up just in case it happens to be the first in a series. This annoyed me so very badly. And I know realistically it's not the book or the author's fault. The book in the series does not sound as interesting as the second book does in the series and so I don't really want to have read it to in order to move on. And now finally we have the last Last category on my list which is weird. These two books were just uh weird and not in like a fun way but in like a uh. The first of these is On a Sunbeam by Tilly Walden. This is a graphic novel. It's an extremely long chunky graphic novel. It is sapphic and it is sci-fi. I read this one a few years back and it's been sitting on my bookshelves since then and it wasn't until Kirsty came last year to visit and did a sort of like systematic pillaging of my graphic novel shelves and we actually sat and talked about this book that I realised that I was keeping it on 
on my shelves despite the fact that I hadn't really liked it that much when I read it simply because it was a chunky beautiful graphic novel which was quite spenny. Which is fair, that's a fair reason if you want to keep something on your shelves because it cost you quite a lot of cash and because it's a pretty object like it's totally fine to keep those books if you want to do that. But space on my shelves is at a premium. It's far less of an issue than it used to be. I've downsized my collection a lot and in fact there's a video coming up on that very soon where we have a quick count and we have a chat about downsizing one's collection. But space on my shelves is never not going to be limited and for me keeping a book that I didn't enjoy really that much the first time around that has tons of plot holes, doesn't really explain a world in which no men exist, just was the wrong reason to be keeping a book on my shelf so that one is gone and then finally sadly deeply deeply sadly and unfortunately there is the Vampires of El Notre by Isabel Canas again you guys know that I liked and really really enjoyed the Hacienda I had a crackingly good time with it I thought that it was a great ride and so when it came up for pre-order I immediately clicked buy on the Vampires of El Notre because I was like oh Isabel can ask that setting and vampires give that to me. Now, I don't know what went wrong but you guys this was terrible. It features two characters who really should never have been together in the first place and who are two of the most whiny unendearing characters that I have ever read. I didn't believe anything that they said. I didn't believe how they felt about it. I didn't believe the choices that were then made after it and when they met up again years later I was like Something is seriously lacking here and unfortunately I think the thing that was seriously lacking was an adult tone to this novel. There's just so much whining and so little doing and so much like building an atmosphere which just kind of feels artificial and doesn't go anywhere. I don't know guys I haven't seen very many reviews for this one so I don't know whether this one has been as well received as the Hacienda. I would be willing to put money on it that there's a few of you out there that are as salty as me about this book. So that is it guys. Guys, that is the end of this salty unhaul. We said bye bye to 50 odd books and I don't regret a single one of them. Was I sad about a couple of them? Sure. But is that a reason to keep them in my house and to not get rid of them because the promise of them wasn't lived up to? No. And genuinely guys, from your queer mam, please take this as a life lesson. Just because you bought a book and hoped to love it, because somebody gave you a book as a gift because they hoped that you would love it, because you got the book for free from a publisher or whatever else and so you feel like you should keep it because that book was handed down to you by somebody you once loved because that book's been in your collection since you were 15 none of these reasons are reasons to keep objects in your home which have fulfilled their purpose which are no longer bringing you joy they served their purpose when they brought you joy sitting on your shelves and being a promising thing for all these years and now they are just like literally like stones in a basket that you are carrying about. Make some room in your brain box and on your shelves for other books that you're going to love and unhaul a book today. If you have got this far through the video then please leave me a box emoji down below to pack up all of the books in it that I am getting rid of in this video. And again if you have read any of the books that I've talked about here today and you would also like to be salty about them down below then go off queen. Use this comment section as your soapbox. I want to hear all of your opinions even if they're different from mine because opinions live here. If you are new to this channel and you enjoyed the salt level and would like to see that again in future videos then please hit that subscribe button and if you are a returning viewer who feels like their skin has been cleansed, their pores are free and clear and you are walking out of the door with a complimentary salt lick to get you through the rest of the day then please hit that thumbs up button on the way out because it really does help my channel and I will speak to you guys really soon. Bye! Oh,